Greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We welcome all of our fans, our watchers and participants as they join us. You join us for the next in our series of virtual Voices of the Game programs. Today, we'll do something a little bit different. You know, we've been talking to managers, players, broadcasters, Hall of Famers, curators. Today, though, we are going to hear from former Major League umpire Gary Darling. Uh, he will be our special guest. We'll begin our conversation with him in a moment. Also want to remind folks that later in the program, we will take your questions for Gary. And to do that, go to the Zoom group chat, or as we like to call it, the chat box. And you can actually type in your questions for Gary. We'll try to take as many of those as we can uh, before our session is over. Also want to remind you that a week from today, that's Thursday, November 12th, 2 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to have another great guest. We're going to talk to Alyssa Nacken. She is the first full-time female coach in Major League history. Uh, she worked as a coach, including a little time as a first base coach with the San Francisco Giants during the 2020 season. So a history maker, a pioneer, Alyssa Nacken will join us one week from today, November 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Today, though, our focus will be on umpiring and also uh, a very important charity, Umps Care. We're very glad to have with us uh, Gary Darling, longtime Major League umpire. Gary, welcome to the program. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure, Bruce. Thanks for having me. This will be a, a nice time. Absolutely. We are going to uh, run down just a few of Gary's credentials. Uh, he began umpiring in the National League back in 1988. Uh, then later, when the National League and American League umpiring crews essentially integrated, umpires would work both leagues, uh, he uh, made that transition, continued to manage until the year 2014, uh, did miss a couple of seasons due to labor disputes, but Gary's career as a major league umpire lasted nearly 30 years, which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, during his career, he worked two All-Star games, 1993 and 2003, and also worked a pair of World Series matchups, 2003 and 2010. One of the highlights of his career came June 13th, 2003. Gary was behind the plate as a home plate umpire for Roger Clemens, 300th win, and also 4,000th career strikeout and was umpire when Mark McGuire made some home run history back in 1998. So lots of things to get to with Gary Darling in today's program. Gary, though, I wanna begin uh, with this charity and I was doing some research on it. It's a, a charity, as I understand it, that is specifically designed to help kids. Um, I was a kid once, uh, believe it or not. Uh, I have a daughter at home, so you know, children and the plights of children, children who are suffering from uh, severe illnesses always strikes a chord with me. I think it strikes a chord with any decent person. Uh, but talk a little more specifically about what Ems Care tries to do and the specific ways it does try to help children around the country. Well, we started back in uh, 2006, um, just kind of helping uh, retired umpires at the time. And we realized to uh, get any kind of sponsorship and donors, we'd have to expand our outreach. And some of the other umpires were already doing some ballpark visits with children and hospital visits. So we kind of merged with them. That was the Blue for Kids charity. Uh, we merged with, with them. Uh, and you know we, we've done over uh, like 100 plus hospital visits over the year where we do Build-A-Bear workshops. Uh, we even continue this year with the COVID. I think we did five or six this year. I think we have one more still coming up virtually, but we still, we bring over a hundred Build-A-Bears, different, uh, give them a choice, let them pick uh, an outfit, just trying to put a little smile on their face for the day, really. Um, and just important with that is putting a, letting their parents see that somebody else is uh, trying to help their children out too, besides the doctors. So that was always the impactful part with our, our uh, hospital visits was, you know, seeing the parents have a little smile on their face too. We've done uh, 8,000 or so. We've had 8,000 people out to the ballparks through different programs like uh, you know, the, you know, the Boys and Girls Club, Big Big Brothers, Big Sisters, uh, Casey Cares, RBI. 
We've had uh, you know different different youth groups out to the ballpark. Let them come down to the umpire room. Let them go out on the field, like you can see on the screen here. Sometimes they get to meet with some of the players. I believe that's Terry Francona there. Mm -hmm. um, but just you just kind of give them a different experience. You know, some of these kids have never been in a big league ballpark. Definitely never been on a big league field. So just trying to you know the kids that have been you know foster care and and that kind of stuff and that struggles just as some kids do. We just try and you know, uplift them for a little bit and, you know, hopefully uh, give them a, give them an idea that there's, there's jobs out there in the sports world, not just in baseball, but anything, or they're, they, they can do anything they want really. But one of the real impactful things that we do, we have a, a scholarship program that we give out. We, we follow a kid from his freshman year through graduation. The scholarship's good for $10,000 a year, as long as they meet the, the academic criteria it's not really an academic scholarship so we're not expecting 4.0s but we do expect them to go to school and and uh you know take the classes and get a degree so we've had uh three graduate already and we're looking because that we started this one a little bit later we started that one probably in 2013 or 14 or so but uh we've had three graduate already uh, one's supposed to grad another one of our recipients is graduating in december and another one in the spring so that's a real impactful one. I mean, it's not just a thousand dollar scholarship one time and here you go. It's 10,000 a year for all four years. So it's just, yeah, like you said, Bruce, it is a youth based thing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it, it gives the umpire something to rally behind it. Uh, it really had helped our group mend some of the ways from our labor disputes too. So in that sense, it was good for our group, but it also shows, the communities around the country, major league baseball cities and minor league baseball cities where we go into, we're uh, doing some of these visits in, in AAA cities, all the AAA cities in 2019 were visited by umpires and stuff. So um, it's you know, something we're all proud of and, uh, but umpires are just like everybody else, you know, they have hearts and uh, I know that's hard to believe sometimes, but umpires do have hearts and we, uh, we like to give back to people, so. I imagine when the umpires go to the hospitals, they, they try to spend as much time with the kids as they can. Yeah, there, there's some of the hospitals, they all have their own protocol. Some, we try and go uh, room to room. Usually the whole, the whole crew usually goes. So there's, you know, two guys in a room and, you know, you go in and help the kids dress the bears and help them pick it out. And sometimes there's uh, big meeting rooms where we'll meet some of the kids, depending on, you know, the ones that are able to get up and move around. So it's, yeah, we, we probably, like I said, we'll give out 100 bears at each hospital visit. I don't think we spend time with 100 kids because a lot of the kids, they just can't, you can't go in their room. Um, but we still like to leave yeah. a bear for them in the, the house and the whole nine yards. So, yeah, it's, it's good for the kids. It's good for the parents. And, you know, it just makes us appreciate, you know, the lives that some of us have that, uh, you know, we're fortunate to be Major League Baseball umpires and, fortunate to be able to give back. Gary, in reading about the charity, the, the focus is on trying to help kids with what you call serious illnesses. Are these in some cases, you know, incurable illnesses or are these kids who have a pretty decent chance of recovering or is it a mix of both? I'm sure, I'm sure it's a mix of both. You know, we don't really get into, you know, one of the first things they tell us at the hospital, don't, don't, you know, say how you're doing today because most of them generally aren't having a good day. You know, sometimes they're in there just for a procedure, but usually it's been in the, you know, the car, the pediatric cardiac room uh, areas or the cancer areas. So I'm sure, unfortunately, some quite a few of the kids we've visited haven't made it, but just as many have too. So yeah. it's not, we're not just seeing terminal kids, but there are some seriously ill kids. The kids that come out to the ballpark, they're, you know, generally healthy and sometimes in foster care and you know, big brothers, big sisters, you know, for whatever different reasons. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not always the sick kids we're trying to help out a little bit, but the hospital visit obviously, you know, rallies around that to a degree. Sure. I'm curious about the kids who come to the ballpark. Do any of them express interest in becoming umpires? You know, a lot of them, when they come here, we've had more success virtually than, we, you know, come at, at the ballpark. A lot of the kids come in, they didn't really know what an umpire was so we'd show them the gear and let them put on the gear and then let them rub up a baseball and you know one of them would have the ball would be on the mound to start the game there's you know they'd rub them up pretty dark sometimes with that 
Delaware River mud. You know, just we're supposed to just try to take the shine off of, but sometimes the balls will get pretty dark, and a lot of times just for have a little fun with it, we'd put the darkest ball out of the mound, and the pitcher would get it and look at it like, uh, and this is not gonna you know, throw it off the field. But yeah. yeah, we just let them, you know, be part of the game. I don't know if any of them have decided to be an umpire that we've that that we've had, but uh, that would be an awesome experience if that that did turn out. We're trying to work that way with other programs we're doing, trying to get more kids and involved in officiating too, so. We encourage our viewers and participants to visit the website. You can see it on your screen. It's umpscare.com. Again, that's umpscare.com. And a little bit later on, we'll tell you which prompt to follow to uh, make a donation if that is something uh, that you're able to do. Gary, I wanna talk a little bit about your early days in college before you decided to become a professional umpire and pursue that career. I understand you played junior college in Sacramento, California. Yeah. Uh, what position did you play and how good were you? <laughs> I played first base. I was uh, a pretty good fielder, but uh, like one scout I knew around town, he said, the only people that are going to draft you, Gary, is the Army or Navy or somebody. So you need to find, if you want to stay in baseball, you got to find something else to do. Um, in junior college, I took some sports officiating classes just as, a, you know, some simpler units. And that's how I started umpiring a little bit. You know, when we were growing up, we'd play pickle or runner or tag up or whatever games. When we had an extra guy, we'd sometimes umpire the play. But up until I, until I got done playing in junior college, I hadn't really umpired any games before. But once I was done with that, umpired a game. And the guy, the first guy I worked with had been to umpire school before, which I knew nothing about. I didn't know anything of the path of how guys on you get to be major league baseball umpires, but got the bug right away. Really enjoyed it. Really loved umpiring. And that's all I did for a couple of years until I was able to go to umpire school in 1980. So you got a taste of it in college, but then it was after college when you, you had a chance to get some hands-on experience. And that's what really kind of tempted you? Yeah, I mean, it was, like I said, the first guy I worked with had been to umpire school, and I wasn't really too fired up about going on to getting a degree in anything at the time. I just wasn't, uh, nothing really had struck my fancy, but the umpiring did. So, I mean, I'd be, sometimes I'd work a little league game, or sometimes, you know, the assigners were pretty good to me. I would, you know, work uh, a Babe Ruth game, you know, 13 to 15 year olds. And then after a little while, even that, you know, within the first couple of months, I was doing some of the, you know, adult league games where um, guys would come back from the minor leagues or had played in the minor leagues. They had pretty good baseball around Sacramento. They still do. But uh, just doing those games and just really, really got excited about it. So, yeah, then was going to, yeah, just wrote, wrote, wrote to the different umpire schools and decided on going to the Bill Kinneman umpire school, which is now defunct, but was bought out by Joe Brinkman and, uh, and Bruce Fremming, a couple of longtime Major League umpires, and then they sold their rights to Jim Evans, an old, a longtime American League umpire, which neither none of those schools are able right now to put people into the minor leagues. There's only two schools now that put umpires into the minor leagues, and that's the Wendelstedt School and then the school run by the by the minor leagues. So, yeah, was, I, you know, I was glad I went that way. I mean, it turned out okay, I guess. You know, we hear that term umpire school, and I have a vague idea as a baseball fan what is involved. But give us a sense. What what do you do day by day? Do you do you take actually academic classes in addition to field work? What's what's a typical day in an umpire school? Well, it's been a long time. It's been 40 years since I went. But uh, I mean, there, there's rule sessions. So you go over every inch of the rule book, every page, every word of the rule book. You know, you do that part of the day and then you you know, they start from the very basics on how to make the basic out call and safe call. And then they add plays at first base. Then you have, you know, how to call plays at first base. And then how to call a steal play, how to get in position to call balls and strikes. It's all based on the two man system is what they use in the low minor leagues up until double A. The first couple, three years you're in the game, you work two man. So you just, how, to, how the coverages work on the field, the rotations, where you go with, you know, run run first base and the balls hit the right field. The plate umpire goes up to third base and the base umpire picks up the batter runner. So there's just every day it just keeps building on itself till you 
we're able to go on after you know it's a five-week class is basically the month of january and uh they just you know you, you just learn the basics of umpiring they want you they don't want all the flamboyant you know emmett ashford or dutch Renard strike calls they just want just your basic strike one you know just just basic umpiring and they cover everything that that they go on in that uh, in that two-man system so if you come in imitating Ron Luciano, you might flunk out. You want, you, you, you'd probably get a little grief from the instructors, but uh, you, you, sometimes, you know, people ask, you know, do you need experience before you go to umpire school? I mean, you'd have, you know, you have a little knowledge of baseball, some instincts on how the game is played. But if you didn't have, you know, if you'd been umpire in amateur baseball, high school, college baseball for five, six years, you develop bad habits as, as how they want it done at the umpire schools and in the minor leagues. So sometimes the less experience is better. I had just enough to, I mean, I, my strong suit, I had instincts. I could, you know, you can kind of tell where the play is developing and how to get there. And, you know, you're not end up chasing the ball and then run into the wrong spot. So it's, it's, you have to have a little feel for the game, but uh, it's, you don't want to have too many bad habits either. So. I'm curious, Gary, do they work with you on having patience, turning the other cheek, accepting a certain amount of argumentation? Is that is that part of the training? Yeah, you, they, they don't want you, you know, a term in umpire, you don't want to be too much of a, you don't want to let them run all over you. You got to, you know, you got to handle situations. You have to listen. And uh, sometimes, you know, once you've heard enough, you just, all right, I've had enough and the managers get to know what your temperament is, but yeah, you don't want to go out there and just be yelling and screaming the whole time. You don't, that nobody, that just ends up falling on deaf ears. I mean, my first, before I went to the Northwest league, I was working a, just an extra game in the Cali. One of the guys had a graduation or something and had to miss a game. So I, I grew up in Sacramento and there was a game at Lodi. So I'm working the bases and call interference on a sliding tag on a, on a front end of a double play at second base, which, you know, normally isn't called too much unless it's pretty flagrant. But, you know, I saw interference. I called interference, a little bit of an argument. Manager comes out and says, well, that's a blank, blank call. And ended up telling him to get the blank out of the game. And both him and his partner and my partner who I was working with, and the manager looked at me like, they just like, oh my God, what'd you just say? And I, I'm thinking, Oh my God, I just lost my career before it even started. And I looked at the man and said, you know, Mac, you're still done. He goes, no, you are. And I really asked, oh boy, this is going to be, I'm done before I go to the Northwest league even. Mm. Luckily the, my partner had a pretty good rapport with that manager and he kind of smoothed things over after the game. And a couple of weeks later, I got to start my career in the Northwest league, but I thought it was over before it started. Yeah. Well, it's a learning experience. I mean, I, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. That's why they have the minor leagues. Let's talk about working in the minor leagues. You mentioned that up until double A, you work the two man crew as opposed to, you know, a four man crew in triple A or in the major leagues. I would think, you know, having to cover an entire field with just two umpires, that to me sounds extraordinarily difficult. Yeah, that's just not exact by any stretch. I mean, there's some plays, you know, plays at the plate, balls and strikes are the same. That's all you got to do plays at first base, but when you're, yeah, in a two man system, you, you got to, you have to call the guy out at, you know, the play, you have to umpire the play at second base and then turn around and umpire the play at first base. So, you know, there's a lot of run around you. A lot of cases that you are somewhat guessing because you just, you just can't see it. You can't get close enough. You can't get the sounds of the play. I think they, and now they, and now in the minor in double A, they work three man and triple A still three man, but I didn't get to do three man till triple A. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not an exact science. I mean, pickoffs, you're calling pickoffs from the middle of the diamond, you know, halfway between the mound and second base and you know, a little off to the side. So you're looking right up the back end of the play on a pickoff. So that, you know, you're just, you're kind of guessing that's, you know, the old adage, well, the ball beat him. He must be out in a two man system. That's, that's kind of factual because something you, you can't see the little tiny misses. Yeah. So, sometimes in four man, you can't see the little tiny misses as you see with replay now in the, at the major league level. Now so. in the two man setup, obviously you have the home plate umpire calls balls and strikes. Right. Once the ball is put into play though, does the home plate umpire then 
get assigned a base or have to come out into the field more? How does that work? Yeah, you, know, you never stay behind the play. You're always in the two-man system. You're always moving. If, if it's just a ground ball that, with nobody on a ground ball to the shortstop, the play down part comes up the first base line now like they do in a four-man system. Mm. He has the overthrow and, you know, but like if the first base umpire, the base umpire, nobody on goes out on a fly ball to right field. The plate umpire has the batter runner all the way around the bases. He has them going, touching first base, going to second base, going to third base. And he has them all the way to home plate if the base umpire can't get back from the outfield and help him out. So, yeah, there's a lot more running around, a lot more running. Run so around first. Think, Go ahead. I would think, Gary, if you can prove yourself that you can handle working as part of a two-man crew, that that almost necessarily dictates that you can handle a four-man crew in the major leagues. No. Uh, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of guys that go to umpire school every year and only a handful make it to the big league. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a progression up. Sometimes you, some guys don't get any better after a ball, you know, they go to triple and the game's too fast or whatever reason they, they've been offered another job at home. So that's, you know, a lot of guys get out just by that, but yeah, just cause you're good at two men doesn't mean you're going to be good at four man. I mean, it just, it just, just doesn't work that way. Yeah, the speed of the game that you mentioned. Uh, what about the temperament of the players? As you move higher up, are the players maybe a little more high strung, a little more prone to temper? I think, no, not necessarily, because the, the guys you're working with in the low low levels are just out of high school or college, and they don't know how to, they don't know how to interact with umpires. They think we're there just for their entertainment or abuse. The higher up you go, they kind of, they start, you get to double A, triple A, You've seen the same organizations. You kind of somewhat follow them along in some cases. So you're seeing the same players, you know. But once it gets to, you know, the biggest step they are, is from between double A AA and triple A. Now you've kind of weeded out, you know, the guy was a pretty good high school baseball player, but couldn't hit the curveball, let's say. So the, the level of baseball starts moving, getting better and better every level. But it's a big jump between A ball and double A. Double A AA to triple A is – a little bit better because now you have guys that are bouncing up and down between the big leagues and triple A. But yeah. the, the hard thing that when you, when you finally get to the big leagues and work in those games, the speed, how, how they can make plays that weren't made in the minor leagues or how quick they can put a tag on somebody. It's just, everything is just much faster in the big leagues. And now, you know, it's, it means money. It means it's their livelihood too. Not just the, it's our livelihood, but it's, you know, big money for the players, obviously. So yeah, the, the, the ramifications are a little bit bigger at the big league level, but the minor leagues, everybody's fighting to get to the same spot. I mean, I think the guys that are grumpy in rookie ball are grumpy in the big leagues, you know, so. 1988, you completed your minor league climb. You debut as a national league umpire. What do you remember about your first game? Actually the first game, how it works when you're, I, my first games were actually in 86. They have in the big leagues, you get, the umpires get vacations during the season oh, okay. or, or people get hurt. So they have a, a group of triple A umpires on call to when they're not, when there's a spe, there's a, nest, a need in the big leagues, you get called up. So that's how you kind of start working your way up at the, at the big league level, even. So it was 86. I, I got to go. Uh, I think I went from Tacoma to Montreal and joined Lee wire and Ed Montague and Dutch Renner, that crew working the Expos and Giants. I mean, it's just, you know, this whole thing, you, you go to umpire school, you know, hoping to get a job in the minor leagues, and then you hope to get from rookie ball to A ball, A ball to double A, double A, triple A. So, you know, getting that call to the big leagues, it's, it's, I mean, it's just a huge step. It's not like you're guaranteed to be a major league umpire because a lot of guys have worked big league games bouncing up and down and don't get that final hiring that final phone call that I got in 1988. That's the one that you, know, you kind of remember when I got the call from uh, Bart Giamatti on a, so a morning in, in late March in uh, 1988 saying that I, my contract was being bought and I'm going to actually get to start the year in Atlanta with on Bruce Fremming's crew. So mm. that was exciting. No doubt about it. It makes all the, all the hard work and the bad hot dogs and the bad travel and all that worthwhile. I want to talk about some of the umpires that were influential on you. And 
Obviously, you were a contemporary of uh, a Hall of Famer, Doug Harvey, uh, who was umpiring back in the 1980s. And I understand you got to know him pretty well. Yeah, Doug, I worked with Doug when I was bouncing up and down. Then I was on his crew for a full year. Uh, I think his second to last year. I think I worked with Doug in 90, 92, I think it was. Still, still keep in contact with his wife, Joy, who's a, just a sweetheart of a lady. Um, yeah, but Doug, I mean, he was, you know, the... When people thought of a of umpire, I mean, you might as well just put his picture in the dictionary. I mean, just very stoic, never got too upset. I mean, he would get upset every now and then, but he most more most times than not kept his composure. Um, you know, just just a, one of the greats of all time, obviously. Yeah, but Did before that, advice. His the main thing Doug would always preach was timing. The most important thing for umpires is timing. Don't don't call a play before it's over and you've had a chance to process all the information that you just saw. So his, his always preach was timing. Just let the play finish, take a split second and then make up your mind. Once you make up your mind, you know, be firm. You don't have to be flamboyant with it. Be just, just making a sure it's solid mechanic, whether a guy's out or safe. And, um, you know, he, he would preach, you know, listen, and then let them have their say. And, you know, if they keep going on and on, then it's time to say, all right, I heard you. It's not going to change. Let's go. And then if they want to keep arguing, that's when somebody gets ejected. Yeah. So he was pretty, pretty, pretty solid umpire. No doubt about it. Another Hall of Fame umpire you got to know, though you didn't work with him. He was, he was someone who came before you, but I guess he was one of your supervisors, Al Barlick. Al Barlick. Yeah. Al was, uh, he, he was more, uh, he was a different kind of umpire than Doug, more of a, a little more of a yeller and screamer and, you know, just rule it with an iron fist kind of guy, but highly respected, you know, just, but back then it was, it was a different game too. I think when Al was working, they, they did some two man in the big leagues or three man. He wasn't four man until much later, but uh, yeah, he was, he was, look, he came down to the minor leagues to look at the uh, guy that I was working with, Dana DeMuth, who ended up, being a, you know, full-time major league umpire. And Al saw me and must have liked something and uh, put my name into the Nash League. And my that next progression started up with getting to go to winter ball and then getting, back then they would buy your option. They wouldn't necessarily buy your contact, but they would buy the option to purchase your contract. Hmm. So that was always a big deal. That's not even part of the process anymore, but yeah. I was pretty influential too. Just, just, you, you always, whether you work with Harry Wendelstead, I worked with Harry, you work, you know, with Bruce Freming, you, you, you couldn't emanate everything they do because everybody had their own style, but you would just try and pick and choose and, you know, what worked, what worked great for Bruce didn't necessarily work for me, but some of the things Bruce did work for me. So, you know, you just kind of just, luckily I was enough to work with some pretty senior guys when I first started and uh, tried to take something from all of them. Were these guys at all intimidating when you talk about a, a Barlick, very uh, verbal, straight on, hit you between the eyes style? And, you, you know, you're talking about giants when you talk about a, a Bruce Freming. Was it intimidating yeah. for a young umpire like you? It could be. Yeah, I mean, it was a little bit. You'd have to, you know, not try and uh, you got to remember your place. That you're just a triple A guy and not try and be, uh, you know, you want to act like you've been there, but not act like you 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 want to act like you belong, but not like you've been there. I mean, it's just, there's a fine line of being a major league umpire and acting like you've been there, but also respecting the seniority of the guys that have been there a long time. So there's, you know, they put you back in your place. If you got a little bit too big for your shoes, there's a lot of tees and a lot of ball busting, a lot of uh, crew camaraderie. A lot of the guys that I, the, the guys that I like working with were the guys that like to do things together as a crew, the guys, the crews that would, the game's over and everybody to go their own way. I didn't like that. So I like, you know, the crew camaraderie. So when I became a crew chief later on, you know, you try and instill that and, you know, play cards with the guys before the game and go have a, a an adult beverage or a soda or something after the game. And sometimes talk about the game, but just get to know them. And just, I always thought that the, the more you knew the guys you worked with, the better off you guys would be on the field. So it was just, Try to work with good guys. I mean, most everybody I worked with, they were all good guys. Yeah, makes you better umpires. You work more as a team. 
No doubt. Uh, another guy that you got to know just a little bit, uh, Jocko Conlon. There's a name from the past. But you got yeah. to umpire an old timers game with Jocko. Tell us about him. He was a classic. I mean, he was another uh, just name from the past. Guys that I, you know, growing up. Once I started umpiring, you know, I would look at the box scores and follow certain names. I think Jocko Jocko was done by then. But he was. He'd always wear a bow tie and. That day we worked with him, he was working third base and he had, he had to be 84, 85 years old. Somebody had a line drive down the left field line. He kind of hopped over the ball, called it fair. And I'm thinking, oh my God, that ball would have hit me. So it was just, didn't get to spend much time with him. We didn't you know, hang out much after the game, but it was, people think I'm nuts when I say I, I work with Jocko Conley. Cause you know, the young umpire would always, you know, kind of tease an older guy like me. So, you know, how was Ty Cobb? Was it, was this, were his spikes really sharp? So when I tell him that I work with Jocko Collin, I, you know, people roll their eyes, but I did work that old timer game with him. Yeah. Uh, when Classic. he jumped out of the way, did he make the right call? That uh, was fair. He had it right. Yeah. If he, if he had it wrong, I wasn't changing it. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't always work out so well. Right. That must be a tough situation. Cause you know, it, it's got to come up when you umpired for nearly 30 years. There are times when you see one of your your crewmates make a mistake. It happens. What are you going to do, though? I mean, you really can't say anything, can you? Well, he has, he has to come to you and ask for help. You can't just, you know, there's there. If it's something real flagrant and you know he didn't see it, we kind of have a little rule that you kind of just walk towards them. And if they see it, you just kind of make a little eye contact, and they know that you might have something different. That doesn't happen much anymore now with replay, but. Yeah. Back when I was working, that yeah, that was kind of one thing we would do. One of my biggest riots on the field was the night we were in Cincinnati and first base umpire called the ball a home run and um, the yeah, the Giants went crazy. They were arguing. So Dutch Renner, the umpire, came walking down to me because I was working home plate. And what we should have done, we all should have got together and got all four of ours opinion on it. But as soon as the ball left the ballpark, I thought to myself, that ball was foul. So when Dutch came down to me and asked me, I just told him it was foul. So he called it foul. I think they're still picking up beer cups from Riverfront Stadium, which has been demolished. I mean, that was uh, yeah, quite a quite a scene. But we should have got all. And I was working with Doug at the time, but we we Doug had the ball foul. The second base umpire had the ball foul. But we all should have got together. Then it doesn't come down on just one umpire being the one to change it. So learning experience already in the big league so Gary when you first started umpiring uh, full-time in the National League 1988 some pretty fiery managers in the National League Larry Boa Whitey Herzog Tommy Lasorda Pete Rose that's not an easy environment to break in Lou Pinella Lou was Lou managing Pinella. the Reds that night of that riot so yeah uh, Jim Leland Leland's first year was 1986 which was my first year um and he always thought, you know, the veteran umpires weren't giving him a fair break. So now we saw, you know, a younger guy like myself come along. So those first few years, Jimmy and I didn't really see eye to eye. But after that, we we got along fine the rest of his career and my career. Yeah, there was a, there was a few characters, no doubt about that. Um, Bobby Cox, he came over a little bit later with the Braves. Uh, you know, Larry Boa, he was a, a fiery guy. Um, yeah, they, you know, they'll test you, but you got to stand your ground, even if, you know, sometimes you're going to be wrong. Most of the time you're right, but they're going to challenge you, especially as a young umpire. And you got to let them know that they're not going to run over you. You're going to, if they get out of line, they're going to get ejected. That's just part of it because both teams see if, you, if you're letting, you know, the team yell, one team yell at you, the other team sees that. So they're going to start yelling eventually. Yeah. Not that you yell and scream every time back at them, but you got to let them know that you're not going to take the grief they're giving you. You got to take, I mean, part of umpiring is taking charge of the game, making sure the game runs smoothly and fairly. And sometimes you got to make that controversial call, you know, and that, that's going to irritate some people, but that's just part of the job. We put up a photo of you and Bob Guerin, who at the time was the A's manager, uh, now the bench coach for the world champion Dodgers. I got to know Bob just a little bit because he used to manage the Utica Blue Sox about an hour from here in Cooperstown. I only yeah. talked to him a couple of times. I didn't know him that well. Um, and I didn't know 
you know, really the style of manager that he was at that point. But I want to use this, this photograph to talk a little bit about the dynamic between the umpire and the manager who is arguing. When a manager comes out, how much will you tolerate in terms of the level of vitriol, the amount of time, and is, is, are there certain words? You hear that, there's that magic word. Are there really certain words that automatically get a guy tossed from the game? You know, in the minor leagues, it's more your, you know, if they preface them, you know, if, they, if they're talking about the call being bad, that's okay. But if they say you're bad or, mm. or other words you might throw out there, then that's usually when they get ejected. Uh, in the major league level, they, they know, most times they get argued just for their one to argue too long or, you know, throwing their hat down or something or just being too demonstrative and not, and not ending the argument. But yeah, you know, anytime they get personal is usually when the ejection comes. You can be, you know, that was a bad call. Like I said, is okay. You're a bad umpire leads to an ejection. But a lot of times it's just them staying out there too long. They, they know they know what lines they they're usually not surprised when they get ejected. They they know they've done something. Either argued, you've told them you've heard enough, you walk away and they follow you. Well, they're going to get ejected or the personal stuff. Or sometimes they they come out. The first thing they say is you know warrants the ejection. The other times it's towards the end of the argument. Yeah. It just it just depends. I mean they're all they're all different. They but if you ask a, a manager they. They, they can't too many times say they were surprised they got ejected because they, they know what they're doing. They're pretty sharp guys when it comes to that stuff. Gary, have you ever had a manager say to you, I want you to throw me out because my team needs a kick in the backside and I want to fire him up. Has that ever happened? That does happen. Not often, but that does happen. I mean, you can, you know, you can tell they would just by the, their demeanor, they, they, they're, they know they're going bad and they're just waiting for any kind of play any play that goes against them and they'll come out and, and you, you can tell, I've had a couple of them say, you know, you're going to have to throw me out of here because my team going bad right now. Yeah. And sometimes in the minor league, they, they, they'll talk to you before the game and let you know that that might happen, but it's not too often. Usually they're pissed off about something. They, 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 they feel they've been wronged about something. And yeah, every now and then it's, it's part of that is they're trying to get their team fired up, but not too often they come on and say, I want you to throw me out because my team is going bad. Yeah. But it does happen. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you, got, you got the picture of Bob, though. He, I mean, I, I had Bob in the Northwest League in 1980 as a player. And then he lived, used to live in the same general area of Phoenix that we lived in. Our kids played in the same little league, which is kind of funny. But he'll get another chance to manage again, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, looking at this photograph, the, the background kind of indicates to me maybe it's a spring training game. I don't know if you remember this incident or not. I, I was looking at that also, but I, it might be at Candle. It might be at uh, in, in San Francisco, because if you look out towards left field, it's kind of open there. But yeah, I see on the back of me, there's a, a monitor for the for the wireless mic. And I don't think that I can't remember that happening in spring training. So oh. that I'm pretty sure that has to be a big league ballpark. But. It doesn't look like Oakland, but he's wearing gray. So it's probably, I, if any place in San Francisco, but I, it's hard to tell by that picture. Yeah. I think it is San Francisco because the, the thing on the lower right looks like the part around the glove out there, but. Yeah. Were there any managers that you really liked and respected because A, they really understood the rules and B, even if they disagreed with you, they did it in a polite way. Were, th were there guys that, you know, kind of ranked high on the list in terms of their character for you? Yeah, there's, you know, Terry Collins was always pretty fair. Um, Art Howe was pretty fair. Uh, Jim Tracy. I mean, there are a lot of guys were fair, I'm just because I'm not naming other names. But um, yeah, as long as, the, you know, they, they, the guys that understood our job and we understand their job, I mean, there are good times they got to come out and argue. But, you know, as long as they didn't get personal and hold, hold grudges and and some some managers just no matter what, just didn't like umpires. Um, there, I didn't come across many that way. Some of the older, they always, the, the, the American guys would say, you know, the Earl Weaver just flat out didn't like umpires. 
Billy Martin was just competitive. If Billy would see the guys in a, in a bar, he'd buy him a beer. Earl Weaver wouldn't do that. <laughs> it was my understanding of that, that kind yeah. of, those kind of guys, but. The thing I heard about Billy, well, I heard a lot of things about Billy Martin, but one thing I heard about him, he knew the rule book better than just about any manager. So if it was a rule-based argument, he might have a good point, but he could obviously be very difficult too. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. You know, a lot of times they know the rules and then try and use them to how they think applies to a certain play. I mean, they, they generally know the rules, but they don't know the rules as well as we do. So, I mean, Mike Sosha knows the rules pretty good, but he's always trying to maneuver them to work in his favor. And there's yeah. some rules he just has completely backwards. <laughs> so... <laughs> Which is okay. You know, I, think Bob, I think Bob Garrett knows the rules pretty well. Yeah. Did you notice a change in umpires from the 80s when you started to the early 2010s, just before you retired? Did they become more mild-mannered? Did they become more reasonable? Umpires? You said? No, the managers. Oh, the managers. Managers. Yeah, yeah they weren't, they weren't the, the real crazy old school kick dirt, go bonkers over stuff. They'd come on, argue, and if they, you know, they'd stay too long and they'd get mad and, you know, want to pick up a base every now and then or something. But I don't think, I think they've kind of just take care of their business. And if they got to get it, if they need to get ejected, they'll get ejected. But it's not that crazy throwing stuff all the time. That just doesn't, you don't see that very much anymore. Now there's really, now there's nothing to argue about. Right. Except for balls and strikes and check swings. That's all. I mean, I, I don't know if the numbers show, but I bet. A vast majority, 90% of the ejections are on balls and strikes or check swings because there's not, there's really nothing else to argue. And your career predated instant replay. The full blown instant replay. I worked when they had boundary call replays on, uh, you know, whether a ball was a home runner or not. But 2014 was the first year that they went to full replay. And I didn't, I didn't work at all in 2014. So I missed the full blown replay. And then it, it changed the way, I mean, the guys now are, their timing, Doug Harvey would be so happy. I'm sure he's happy from heaven looking down because their, their timing is phenomenal because mm -hmm. now with, you know, sliding tag plays, they, they keep the glove on the guy until the dirt's done falling out of the sky, just waiting for him to come off the base by that millimeter or pop on the, hit the front end of the base on a steel blade and their foot pops up an eighth of an inch and the gloves on him and, Forever in a day, that was always he's safe. But with replay, now it's an out. So these the guys now work, and their timing is phenomenal. Their balls and strike calls phenomenal, phenomenal. Being compared to that K zone you see on TV, yeah. these guys. I mean, they're they're doing a great job now. Gary, I want to talk about some of your World Series assignments. You had two. Uh, the first one was 2003, a, a tough one for me as a Yankee fan. Uh, it was a great season, though. Uh, that was the year that Aaron Boone hit the uh, uh, game-winning home run in Game 7 of yeah. the ALCS. But then the Yankees ran into that uh, Florida Marlins uh, buzzsaw. Uh, you had two very different managers, Jack McKeon, Joe Torre. It was a six-game series. In looking back, were there, were there any particular tough calls, uh, any, any arguments or controversies that you recall from that one? I don't think so. That was a pretty, uh, pretty calm World Series, if I remember right. I don't, uh, you know, I wasn't real thrilled with my my plate job, but uh, that's because we're so we're so hard on ourselves. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really, I don't think there was much. I mean, I think that was the pitcher for the uh, uh, Beckett was the pitcher for the Marlins. I mean, he was just dominating. I mean, he, I think he threw a complete game in Game Six. That's right. I don't know if fate's the right word, but they were the better. They they wanted it more in that World Series, it seemed like. they. I, won't, I will have to say the better team won. Did it feel a lot different for you umpiring a World Series game after, you know, you've done championship series games prior to that, obviously a lot of regular season games. Did it feel very different? Was it nerve-wracking being in a series for the first time? Yeah, it was, definitely was different. I mean, you know, there's no other games going on, and that's, that's the last two teams standing. So, yeah, there's, there's that extra pressure, but that's, you know, you kind of put that on yourself, which doesn't always help. It was definitely different, though. They, you know, just the media coverage, and it's, it's the World Series. So, 
you don't want to be on Sports Center. That's 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 the main goal. You get your pitches right, get your play right, and not have that controversial play that you be become defined by. So that's uh, that's that's the goal going in. Is you yeah. want just you and your crew do well and not be on Sports Center. I'll tell you, the managers themselves were a great storyline. There, you have Joe Torre, future Hall of Famer. Yeah. You have Jack McKeon, who I think was 80 at the time. He was up there, yeah. yeah. Well, he, he's not 80, but he was he was at least in his late 70s. He was the the oldest manager in the game and a guy who had been, you know, seen everything going back to the 1970s. Uh, I'm not sure. Did, something. did he take over that team partway through that year or was he with them that whole year? Because I, I remember he, he kind of came in and out of the front office and took over that team at some point, either 2002 or three, but. Yeah, Jack was a good manager. He could get a little fired up sometimes, but he was fair. You know, all you want, if you, you know, you, you just want a manager that's going to treat you fair. Every day is a new day. I mean, Bobby Cox got run a thousand times, we'll say. Obviously not near that many, but every day was a new day with Bobby. Yeah. I mean, he, he didn't hold grudges. And I don't think Jack did either. You know, I want to say that Jack came in middle of the season replacing John Bowles, maybe. I think you're, yeah, John was, yeah, that could be yeah, right. That's, that's the name that I'm not 100% sure, but that's the name that comes to mind. Right. Uh, a couple other great highlights to talk about. 2013, and you're behind the plate for the game when Roger Clemens is pitching. And not only does he get uh, his 300th win, but he gets, uh, what, his 4,000th strikeout as well. Yeah. Uh, talk about being behind the plate for history like that. Is, is it tough to put that out of your mind? Because you don't want to be biased. You don't want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt just because he's going for milestones and records. Or is it something you just can't get out of your mind because everybody's talking about it? No, it's just another game. I mean, you, you don't give anybody a benefit of the doubt. I mean, you got Clements pitching, but you got guys, you know, trying to hit 300 or Cardinals with the other team. They're trying to win the game too. So, you know, those games, I mean, that's just, you just, you just don't even think along those lines. You, you know, you've been kind of, you know, you follow the media and he kept going and not getting the win. So we kind of knew that we were going to have the series the next time he was going to have, it, it was going to be my play job. So, you know, it's, I didn't know about the strikeout, but I knew the 300th game part was coming up, but yeah. you just try and go out there and work the game. I mean, that's, that's all you can. You can't try and do anything else, but just on part of the game. When the game's over though, do you look back and say, hey, that was nice to be a part of that? Oh, yeah. You like being part of those kind of games. Yeah, when they're said and done. I mean, you know, we our crew uh, a few years before had the Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, when they when they when when McGuire was coming down. Well, they were both close, but McGuire was a little bit ahead. He was going to break the record. And we were in St. Louis for five days when he hit 60, 61, and 62. I don't know if you can see over my shoulder up here, but there's a – and I have a line of cards signed by him and some pictures from that, from that uh, moment there. But uh, it was, you know, you like those kind of things for sure. I mean, it's, you don't work the games for those memorable moments, but you, they're nice when you become a part of them. Yeah. We're going to take some questions for our guest, uh, longtime umpire, Gary Darling, uh, gracious enough to join us for virtual voices of the game. If you have a question for Gary or maybe an observation that you'd like him to comment on, uh, you can just type it into the Zoom group chat. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, first up, we have one from JT. Uh, JT writes, uh, respecting that umps are human, does it ever get annoying when catchers constantly are trying to frame pitches, sometimes absurdly so? That has become so rampant now. I mean, they have matrix metrics for it with the teams on quote unquote catcher stealing pitches. That, I mean, it doesn't help. I mean, if you got to be, if, if they just depends on how they catch it, but yanking pitches and pulling the gloves six, seven, eight, a foot sometimes, that's, it's just, it's gotten, it's gotten out of control. I mean, it doesn't help. It doesn't, it used to be, I mean, I remember uh, the catcher with the Pirates, Jason Kendall. This is back in the 90s. I mean, he would, if it was a good three, a good slider that caught the corner knee high, he wouldn't try and make the pitch any better. He would just, just catch the pitch. Because he knew back then, if you tried to frame it and move the glove around, 
the pitch would become a ball just because if it was, if it was a strike, then why'd you yank it? You know, right. just, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't, I completely don't understand how they really think the yanking of pitches is helping. I mean, the subtle framing, or just, you know, by having most of your glove in the strike zone and catching the ball, you know, in the bottom part of the, the catcher's mitt with the majority of the glove in the strike zone, that's framing, not that. That's yanking. That's that has that doesn't help anything. And if they go to the automated strike zone, it's not going to matter anyway. So, yeah, I think that there's some, you know, great major league catchers now, but a vast majority of them, they just just yank pitches. And it's, I don't know how, I mean, it'd be hard to umpire in that kind of stuff now. I don't know how the guys do it, getting the pitches as right as they do. So, if you know, if they, they catch one and it's off the plate, and they yank it. The umpire thought it was a good pitch anyway. So he's calling it a strike. Them yanking it is not what made the umpire call the pitch a strike. So excellent. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, that, that's that's excellent answer. Uh, one of our regular participants, Reg Jones, wants to ask actually about your charity, uh, Ump's Care. Is the charity just involving major league and former major league umpires, or do minor league umpires get involved as well? The minor league umpires are very much involved. We've expanded and uh, didn't get to do it this year because there was no minor league baseball. But 2019, every every Triple A city had a had an event. So all the all the crews got involved. They're 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 involved with our different fundraisers. Uh, you know, running 5Ks and raising money. So yeah, it's it's not all the way through the whole minor leagues, but we'd like to. But it just our staff isn't big enough for that to happen. So um, they do a great job running the, the charity as it is much, but to, to expand too much farther would be hard, but it's not, it's on our radar to go to all the minor leagues, but that's still a little ways away, I think. Yeah. But here's the minor league guys are involved. That's great. Uh, here's a terrific question from Mark Miller. What is the difference between a triple A umpire and a major league umpire? In other words, name the top three reasons that a triple-A umpire might not make it to the major leagues? That's a good, you know, um, just handling situations. Um, obviously, getting your plays right when it's being evaluated, because the major league umpires are evaluated on every play, every pitch they have. And, you know, the minor leagues, you know, you could you have a close play and yeah, he's out or safe. Nobody can really tell. It's not not generally on high def TV with 20 cameras on. You get to the big leagues, you have to get your plays right. Even with replay, you have to get you got to get a vast majority of your plays right. And the handling situations has always been one of the biggest ones. Um, yeah, a lot of times it's you know being in the right place at the right time and of having a a beanball situation and handling it correctly as opposed to not handling it or overreacting. So it's you know. It's, your demeanor, handling situations, and, and getting your plays right, and, and and being at the at the right level of your progression up the minor league ranks when there are spots in the big leagues. Now they take AAA umpires and they take them. With one of their main evaluation spots is the fall the Arizona Fall League out here. So mm -hmm. you have to try and get on the Fall League schedule, and then you're seen all the time, and then you start refining your strike zone to to meet the criteria of being evaluated by a computer. So it's, it's, it's a challenge and it's just cause you get to work fall league or, or get big league spring training. You still got a lot of hurdles to jump cause there's a lot of good young umpires fighting for, you know, very few jobs for the most part. Question from a gentleman named Steve Sankner. Uh, having worked in the Atlantic league in 2019, I witnessed an entire season of robo umpires. I did not like it at all. What are your thoughts? <laughs> it's it's a it's a great teaching tool. I think it's uh, it's I think they should have on all the games for entertainment purposes only, because it has it's already done what its intention was was to get a more uniform strike zone. But when you watch a game and that pitch comes across the screen and that little dot goes up on the on the K zone or whatever. I'm still trying to figure out what part of the pitch that is that they're deeming it a ball or a strike. So 
you know, that's why, you, you know, now you see the low strike not being called so much because they're trying to adjust because the, the, the pitch that they can't officiate with a computer is the, the low curveball, the, the 12 to 6 curveball that catch, might catch the front knee and be over the plate, but land on top of the plate. I mean, that's just not a strike. By rule book definition, maybe, but not in actual working of the game. So I won't say it'll never happen, There's, a, but I, I truly believe that machine has a long ways to go till it's ready for live action on at the major league level. I have not seen it. Where is it positioned and how does it not get in the way? The machine, <laughs> that box? <laughs> Or uh, I mean, they, they they use cameras to triangulate the the path of the ball, and then computer. I mean, it's it, but it you know if you, they don't change it, the hard part of it in real time is you know you got say Aaron Judge played for the Astros or Altuve played for the Yankees. You got a guy six six coming up, and now you got a guy five six. On TV, you don't that box doesn't adjust. It's the same same rectangle whether it's Judge or Altuve which right. isn't the case, obviously. The strike zone's completely different. The strike zone's different whether the guy's in the front of the batter's box or in the bat of the batter's box. You know, where the catcher, I mean, it's there's not one particular part of a pitch that makes it a ball or strike. It's the whole path of the pitch. Yeah. From the pitcher's hand to where the catcher catches it. And that that's what determines whether it's a ball or a strike. I mean, it's, I, it, they're, they're trying to get it there, but they're, I think they're trying with to get the umpire, but, but it's still a ways away. Yeah. Even with the robotic umpire, don't you have to have a human umpire to actually make the verbal call? Well, and the, the league the gentleman was talking about earlier in the question, he had they had a little microphone in their ear, if I'm right, and they the machine would say Boop, strike or ball, and they would they would make the the mechanic. But yeah, you need the umpire there for plays at the plate. You need them there for check swings. You need them there for hit batsmen. Yeah. So. And that's, you know, that's our part. They want one of the things and I'm, my understanding was they wanted the umpire still to call balls and strikes or, or correct any egregious errors. I mean, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's hard to sit back there and it's hard enough to call a game when you're concentrating trying to call every pitch. But now if you're, you're expecting the computer to call it and all of a sudden now the computer says strike and you say in your mind, there's no way. Now you're going to, start changing those so I, I don't see that part working either but they're trying I know they're trying last questions from our audience from uh Bill Baxter I actually went to school with a Bill Baxter I wonder if that's the same guy anyway did you ever umpire a no hitter or a perfect game uh not behind the plate when the minor leagues I had a perfect game behind the plate uh, in double a but uh I was on the bases for no hitters but never had the plate for a no hitter in the big leagues or a perfect game. Do you remember the pitcher for the minor league game? It was a big kid with a giant. Um, not right off the top. Yeah. Uh, Someone who made the majors or? I don't think he did, no. Really? No, Okay. I don't think he did. Scott, nah, I'd be guessing. Okay. I can kind of picture him, he was a big kid, but I don't think Lefty. he had, I don't, I don't think he made the big leagues. Lefty or righty? Righty. Righty. All right. Well, we'll try to figure it out later. Yeah. Uh, before we let you go, Gary, we really enjoyed this last hour. I uh, want to ask about your visit to Cooperstown. Uh, you came here in September of 2019. So a few months before this pandemic set in, you had a chance to take a tour of the museum, uh, see some behind the scenes uh, items. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. And, and that was your first time here. And I in reading the article that Bill Francis wrote at our website, it sounded like you had a blast. Oh, what a what an experience! I'd I'd recommend it to any everybody. I'm sure most of the people on this little conference here have been there, but uh, it's it's just a baseball fan has to go. I mean, the, the town of Cooperstown, the people are nice. I mean, it was just a beautiful time of year. I didn't get to play golf, so I got to rectify that, but. Uh, yeah, I got to, you know, saw Doug Harvey's uh, plate shoes, which I'd seen live before, but um, I still can't remember whose glove that was. It was the glove in the picture. There was a scout that was friends with the umpires. And I'm just, the name escapes me now. I'm, I'm embarrassed by that, but 
I mean, just some of the stuff down there, the artifacts, I mean, just the Hall of Fame has so much stuff. I mean, what's out there is what, like 5% of what you have or less. I mean, it's just incredible. I'd recommend it to, you don't even have to, being a baseball fan helps, but just the history of the place is unbelievable. Did you get to see any of those old inflatable chest protectors American League umpires used to wear? I didn't see one down there, no. No. I, okay. I, I'm sure there are certain stuff that they have in other areas that aren't in the room downstairs. I don't think everything you have is down there. But, uh, yeah, they, yeah, it was, it was, I think I saw Ty Cobb's bat or something. He was, they had some other stuff out on the table. But, I mean, it's just, the history is unbelievable. Without a doubt. I know you and your wife took a long trip in the car to get here, but uh, sounded like it was worth every minute. It definitely was. We should have spent a few more days. If we do it next time, we're <laughs> going to spend a little bit longer. That's for sure. As we get to wrap up with uh, Gary Darling, want to mention uh, once again, the umpire's charitable organization. It is called Umps Care. The website is uh, umpscare, U-M-P-S-C-A-R-E.com. If you go to there, there's then a tab uh, that says support us. And there's various ways uh, you can become a sponsor. You can make a one-time donation. Uh, we do encourage people though to go to the website. If there's anything that they can give, it's a great cause to help out kids who are having uh, medical issues of various kinds many of them uh, of a serious nature. Uh, and it's also an opportunity to uh, help out the kids who are able to go to the ballpark and engage with some of the players and the umpire. So again, umpscare.com and go to support us. Anything that you can give to this great organization, uh, I know would be greatly appreciated. Gary, we really appreciate the time. I learned a lot about the art of umpiring and we, we thank you for being with us. My pleasure, Bruce. I appreciate it very much. I'd love to do it again. Absolutely. We will uh, we'll keep you on our list. Former <laughs> Major League umpire Gary Darling has been with us over this past hour. A reminder that next week, Thursday, the 12th of November at 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, our guest will be San Francisco Giants coach Alyssa Nacken. So that's coming up one week from today. We again thank Gary Darling. We thank all of you for viewing and listening. Also for the great questions as well. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Thank you, everybody.